Yeah. Or, okay, quickly. Um, do you have somehow uh, monitor what uh, what experts who work for you uh, are to, when they are interviewed by media? Do you somehow uh, have a, a feedback so you comment, uh, you try to to improve their uh, communication skills? Oh yeah. Uh, or or um, let's say uh, you don't. I assume from the answer there is a usually not problem uh, that. Uh, the experts, uh, your experts who are interviewed by the media, that they don't have enough space to explain that. Also, perhaps, uh, perhaps specificity of the of the Central Europe or maybe, maybe my country that uh, usually the the experts uh, are seen for 30 seconds on the on the um, screen and they say half a sentence. Yeah. Um, so you, we have we have uh, the. Um, one uh, NGO which is monitoring the quotation number of experts mm -hmm. and so we have a list who are the most quoted experts uh, um, Grigory Mesežnikov is the most quoted but the problem is that he is always for for 15 30 seconds saying half of the sentence which act he actually said which was cut into half mm -hmm. and that's that's presented and it's really not uh, not giving the expert right. uh, message right, well, there are two things there one is I don't advise people to do sound bites I mean, first of all, you've got to say, the only, you shouldn't be demand-driven by the media. Uh, it kind of goes against what I was saying all along, but the media, don't, they come to us all the time, Fox News, saying, we want someone to say, talk to Iran, so somebody else can say, you're bloody stupid for talking to Iran. We're not going to do that. When we produce something like this, I will have a proactive program of media outlets we want to target in Iran, in internationally and in the United States domestically and we'll go out because those are the right vehicles to get our message out because you will get it out at least in this format the summary if not the whole thing I'm not going to do a soundbite that's just going to make us look unintelligent open to attack or anything else so I advise them not to to do things when they do do something I our press officer will go along and make sure that it's fairly represented that they don't get stitched up and half of what they say gets used in the, in the wrong context. So we approach it both by being proactive and deciding what we want to do, and then when we do do stuff, we make sure we do it carefully. So, but don't go chasing, don't let the media build the agenda for you. Don't let them chase you and say, you know, take control of it before your product comes out and say, who do we want to do? I would like to go with the last round of questions. I think I have uh, two, one by Viola and then Tevan. Uh, yeah, okay, one more. Actually, it's one question, but maybe it has two uh, <laughs> sub, sub uh, issues, but I will be very brief. What you've said, uh, suggested, presented to us was extremely um, instructive, engaging, and walking a fine lines when it's a choice between proactive and responsive, between supply demand driven, uh, demand driven and all kinds of dilemmas that one has to handle. And all of us, uh, I assume, had a easy, um, uh, an easy possibility to imagine how it works in established and a large and very respected institutions. But most of us are coming from an environment where our institutions are really small compared to your one, tiny, <laughs> I must use that. The uh, environment is, is, is less than responsive or, or kind of open to what we are saying, uh, and uh, our resources are much, much more limited in terms of human capacities. Now, let me just uh, raise two uh, of, of the advices you gave and how you can imagine working in the environment uh, that I just described to you. And uh, from your account, it's very obvious that you are observing institutions that are emerging, that are small in your uh, career, you uh, encounter different environment than the Carnegie and the US. So, for example, uh, how it works um, when you have a tiny institution and you want to keep some reserve resources to uh, uh, react to uh, uh, just suddenly coming calls, uh, challenges and so on, the, the Iraq, the, the Russia, um, Georgia conflict and so on. Um, you would always reserve a small kind of space, a little reserve, or just have the internal trust. You squeeze your stuff thin, or I mean, what have you seen good examples when you just don't have this kind of reserve? Because this is the nature how you build an institution when you normally stretch your stuff thin rather than you know have a reserve for just un, unexpected uh, 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 situations to respond to. And the other one is when you describe that you need a credible, 
sound research capacities and voices, and you mostly trust on the uh, opinion of your researchers rather than develop institutional positions. That is very rare, but I think the situation is most cases the reverse. We don't have the vocal, we don't have the uh, voices of authority, or it's very rare. Maybe we have one. A maximum two on, on staff, rather we don't have any or only one. But the, the best chance for us is to develop a strong institutional position and communicate to the public. So have you seen good success and failure stories when you just don't have that flexibility that you very nicely described how it works in, in the Carnegie? Yeah, I mean, these two grants, you know. Yeah, absolutely. Our overseas offices, our office in China is six people. Um, pretty big country, pretty important country. Um, we don't do normal events the way we do in Moscow or in Washington. We don't produce that much information. In fact, I do no Chinese media outreach at all. Mm -hmm. The point of operating in China, because it's, it's everywhere we are, you operate differently. And it's a small office which I want to grow. The important thing is to grow it in the right way. So we understand how we have to operate in China. We are working on an issue. The first thing we are doing, which I should have a policy brief on here, is breaking the mutual suicide pact between Washington and Beijing on climate change. Mm -hmm. This is something both China wants and the United States and the world wants. So we're working away on track two diplomacy. And the point is we're working on something that is mutually beneficial to both. And we're building an office with a reputation as not being annoying, not being, you know, publicity <coughs> conscious, that we're building up a, an institution that has an institutional position on helping bring the two countries together in a globalizing world. So that's how we're building that up. In the meantime, I would love to be out selling this to the media, but it's not profitable to do so. So we're very careful about keeping a low profile and putting the work first, and that's how we're doing it. Mm -hmm. um, Similarly in the Middle East, we're doing more interviews now, but we're doing things like the Doha debates in Qatar. We're doing BBC Middle East service, which gets a pan-Arab audience. And only once we've built up a credible body of work. So we're making sure that the work comes first, and then the media stuff happens gradually when it's important. And when you say, you know, if, if you've got limited resources, do you stretch staff to do media interviews? No. The important thing, if I'm going to risk my reputation which start with staff, which I do every day, is to get the work right mm -hmm. and in a, in a form that everybody wants. It's not to go and do a Fox News interview or, or something else. The important thing is, is, is simply to, to build your relationship with scholars and the relationship with your institution so that you can then ask for those favors later on when it's important.